sometimes people have what it takes, but they haven't recognized it yet. Just go forward. So what do you need to do? Welcome everybody and hello, this is Andrew. What you need to do is be that person that's different and it's bigger than you think. Rise from the ashes of why like the pieces that you are. We do going over all sorts of different topics and I am constantly working at, um, at, <laughs> to provide content for you guys. And the best way to do that is to find people that are better at what they do than I am and bring them on and get them to share their wisdom with you. And so I connected with Henry actually at um, the speakeasy in Austin is where I first met him. The son of Steve Sims, author of Blue Fishing. A lot of you guys. I was accidentally muted. So uh, a lot of you guys know who that is. And, and um, some of you probably have that book there handy. I've got mine on my shelf right here behind my Yoda. So if you haven't yet, go pick up Blue Fishing. Phenomenal book. And we'll get that there. But um Henry himself, co-founder of Sims Media. And, you know, when we're in Austin, I got a chance to, to hear him. He got up on stage, spoke to us a bit about marketing, about branding, about, you know, connecting with your audience, doing that research and, and just building yourself up as a business. And I want, I asked him to come on and just chat with us. You know, he's had an opportunity to meet and work with a lot of different people. And has some pretty great insight as far as branding goes and utilizing social media. You know, he's kind of been the bridge for bringing his dad onto all of these platforms and and helping him get out there. So, Henry, Mr. Sims, I appreciate you being on. Absolutely. Happy to be here. So you're in California, right? That's correct. L.A. And I mean, you just got done with like a Vegas trip and doing cool stuff. Oh man. Yeah. Did a a Harley ride out to Vegas uh, for the Foo Fighters concert and then rode back. Yeah. Very cool, man. I saw that at the concert and and you guys rolling up there. Now I want to just kind of start here. So a lot of these guys know about your dad. He's kind of, he's called the modern day wizard of Oz. You know, I was introduced to him through Joe Polish and and the genius network and um, proto marketing and all that years ago, I started following him and, you know, um, got his book and everything. So one of the things that he's kind of known for, he's, and there's a couple of cool topics that I want to kind of get your thoughts on, but um, he's known for helping make things happen for people that, you know, maybe they're not sure how to go out of their way to make it happen, right? Some cool event, um, you know, whether it be a party, a, an evening or a weekend doing something incredible and amazing, you know, heading down to the Titanic, the the private dinner in front of uh, Michelangelo's David, doing all sorts of different stuff. What was it like growing up with your dad as your dad? Because he's he's a different guy. He's pretty cool. Yeah, I think the answer will probably surprise most. Growing up in the entrepreneurial family that we had, it's a very successful entrepreneurial family. But at the same time, as as you know, the life of an entrepreneur is like this. And so as a little kid growing up in it, I only saw, uh, I only resonated with the, the lows. That's what stood out to me was, you know, we had awesome experiences and opportunities, talks to cool people, but the, the lows hit me too hard to make me even want to care about the world of entrepreneurship. I wanted nothing to do with it <laughs> at all. And so I actually tried just going the opposite direction. I was like, you know, I'm going to go what everyone says through high school, get into a good college, get a good job, safe and secure uh, life and uh, be nice and easy breezy. But, um, you know, eventually that came, came back around and realized that that really wasn't the life I wanted. And those highs that I was ignoring of the entrepreneurial life was uh, what would fulfill me way more. And was so, there something that that kind of made you shift directions? You know, what, like, was there a, a moment that was a realization or was it something that added up? Like, what made you shift? Yeah, there was, I, I would say there was um, at least two big kind of points. The first one was in high school. And I had already decided that I'm going to go into college for engineering. And that was like freshman year of high school. Sophomore, sophomore year my dad forced me into this entrepreneurship retreat for kids. 
And at this retreat, they asked us to, uh, they, they exposed us to a lot of different ways people made money, um, a lot of different businesses that I didn't even know you could kind of make a living off of. So it, it broadened my mind, but they also asked us to draw out what we wanted our life to look like. And that was the first time I'd been asked to do that. And I didn't know how the hell to do that. I didn't know what existed in life. So for me, I actually wrote down what I didn't want my life to look like. And I started by writing out the things I didn't like and didn't want to start shaping the kind of narrow the path that I could pursue. And so that followed me all the way up until now. And I still use it, that process of elimination. And in college, I did two different degrees and mechanical engineering and kinesiology. I was doing different little part-time jobs. I was- Wait a minute, mechanical engineering and kinesiology? Like, correct. Like physical science? Yeah. Okay, it's a different <laughs> combo. Well, I didn't so you, do them so at you, the same time. I was so you went through, between them. So you went through the that process though as a kid and then still went to college yeah. and, and then got not one but two degrees then. I right. dropped out. Oh, <laughs> yeah. there you go. That's where the, the shift came was um, as I was doing these degrees, I... as I was volunteering and doing as much as I could to be immersed in it and kind of see what that life would look like. I realized as much as I liked the study and I was interested in it, it didn't fulfill on the day-to-day lifestyle that I wanted. And okay. that's when I was able to start understanding what the things that I wanted versus what I didn't want. And it was freedom of my time, freedom of my location and control. Mm -hmm. And the jobs I was working, I would work harder than everyone else, but it didn't do anything more for me. I was getting the same pay, but I was also going to the same location. I was on a set schedule. I couldn't just go and travel and do what I wanted. And so those were the biggest points that hit me that realized that I can't do this. I'm too curious. I'm too ambitious. I, I just don't like being set on this traditional path. And that's what uh, finally clicked. And I just dropped out and uh, started jumping in and helping my dad out and seeing what his world truly looked like and being much more open to it versus when I was a little kid. So were you helping with the, the events and kind of the planning behind the scenes and seeing things through? <laughs> I was helping with anything I possibly could. Uh, I didn't know what, what a business looked like, what was involved so yes, I started I started helping out with the events, making sure logistics was working. Um, but then I also started just looking at what my family was doing. So what kind of programs did they have to use to make the business run? Uh, how were they communicating with their teams? How were they managing projects? How were they gaining clients? How were they branding themselves? I looked at absolutely everything. So the ops, the, the marketing and branding, and then the customer retention overall, like you were looking at the business, op, the, the, you know, what needed to happen, not necessarily the flashy stuff out front, but what needed yeah. to happen to keep the, the engine moving. Yeah. How did you make that transition into now with, with Sims media? What's your, what do you do with Sims media? Explain that to everybody. And then I, I want to know how you mm -hmm. made that transition to that. Yeah. With Sims Media, we help personal brands and lifestyle brands uh, gain extra clarity on their brand, strengthen it, and then we amplify it in any means possible. Okay. So today, podcasting, social media, uh, these are very effective and popular media outlets. So we really utilize them to the maximum to help amplify our clients. The jump into the branding was because as I was helping my family's businesses, I was making connections. And those connections had other masterminds, other types of uh, groups. And they started just inviting me along. And anywhere that they would let me in, I'd be down there. I was driving yeah. hours every month just to sit in a little office and listen to the conversations that they were having with their clients to see what kind of problems existed. And I saw so many people with awesome businesses, awesome solutions, services, products, but they didn't know how to get it out there. 
and right. they didn't know how to actually brand themselves. And so what I did, what I saw was it wasn't the service or the product they had an issue with. It was how they actually communicated it to their audience that they had an issue. Right. And that, that kind of flicked with me. And so that's when I made that switch. So one of the things you talk about going to a lot of events and doing different things, and that's something I, you know, and, and in doing that, you've built some relationships, right? Mm -hmm. How important do you think? And I mean, you're coming from, you know, with your dad, who's one of those guys that it's all about those relationships, right. And building up that, the reputation and then delivering on that and providing value above and beyond. Um, How do you think reputation or relationships have helped kind of form who you are and how you see yourself doing business? And then I want to get into some of the marketing stuff, but yeah relationships have done so much. It's hard to say anything in specific. They have sped up the process of learning in a lot of areas. You've been, if you're, you know, there's a lot of people who say you have to make mistakes, but our, our society has improved so fast because we have this ability to communicate with the generations coming. And so we constantly are improving and improving as a society. And so if you can have these relationships where you can actually learn the mistakes they made so that you don't have to make them, that speeds up your process so much faster. So that has been one of the biggest things with the relationships that I've made is being able to hear the kind of issues they've dealt with and be more prepared for it when it comes my way, if it even comes to yeah. me at all yeah you got a so, chance to avoid it because you you're prepped walking up to it so you go no i gotta turn left yeah. that's that's something to avoid exactly yeah well cool man so all right most of our members here are they're beginning this process of building out a brand and we talk a lot about personal branding mm-hmm. you know in in what we have today with social media and what facebook and you know meta is doing and instagram and LinkedIn and podcasts and everything else. How important is the personal brand? The personal brand helps create this connection. So if you are looking at two of the exact same companies or services, but one is just this uh, title and service, but the other is the title, the service, and a person, you get to see who you're dealing with. You get to kind of understand how they work and their ambition, their story, their purpose. And knowing that allows you to connect even further. And so where there's so many of the same competitive businesses out there, if you can connect with your clients by showing them how you run the business, why you run the business and show that drive and the passion for it, that creates, that makes it a lot easier for those potential clients to trust you and want to work with you. And so I think that it's that personality, that human element that allows your clients to connect with you much easier than other businesses. So what do you say to people that are, are scared to do it? Yeah. To be that, to put that personal element out there. It's, there's a misconception that you have to be really loud and energetic and just like the, the big showboats that everyone sees on social right. media because they yell really loud, but that's not where everyone resonates. The, the your clients will resonate with you. And so it, you don't need to be, a mass market favorite yelling up on stage. You just need to be you. And it's a whole lot easier to be you and you connect with the right people. You also don't want to work with people that you don't really want to work with. (laughs) If you have that luxury, it's nice to be able to connect and work with the people that actually resonate with you. Yeah. But that, that is the, um, that's what you need to realize is you're not going to connect with everyone. And that's the beauty of personal branding. You immediately reject those and connect with the ones who do resonate with you. Well, then what do you say people, because a lot of people that are getting into, 
And I love, I love having, you know, you on your dad and others when it's kind of like um, when you're working with your kids or you've got your spouse and you say something and they don't listen. And then they hear someone else say the exact same thing. And they're like, Oh my God, <laughs> Henry said something so intelligent. And that was fantastic. <laughs> I'm like, damn it. I've been saying that for, but so what about those, um, you know, the people that say, well, I, I want to connect with everybody. I, you know, I don't want to limit who I, who I work with. And, and, you know, this is something that can help everybody. And I want to, you know, the, the only way to make as much as I want to, or do as much as I want to is if I connect with everybody. Mm-hmm. So what do you say there? I say that you're going to make business harder for yourself. There's no, there's no saying that you don't go mass market, but starting out, it's wiser to niche down and actually connect very specifically with those people who are going to be the most loyal customers. Because when, like, if you're just starting out, there's also this proof of concept. So you need to make sure you're, you're speaking to the exact client that you can most serve. And then once you've done that, you start building up the testimonials and the proof and the community behind what you do. And then you can start kind of branching the messaging out to a wider market. Get more. Exactly. Yeah. But so if with- you don't start with proving that there's a loyal group behind what you do and there's actual uh, results, it's harder to branch mass market because there's so much competition. Well, so without naming any names, do you have any examples of someone that you've kind of had this conversation with where they're like, Oh no, what I've got, my solution works for everybody. Um, you know, you don't understand my brand, my product, et cetera. Like I could help, mm-hmm. you know, everybody. And then what kind of results they got when they niche? Do you have anybody you've worked with kind of like that? We've, we've had quite a few people in the kind of like home business space, the online training space, and you, you can teach anyone at any age, uh, any gender, how to uh, make a business at home. But when we were working with them, we were saying, okay, that's very true. But again, there's a whole lot of competition within that space. Who do you personally most resonate with? What kind of demographic zone do you most resonate with? What kind of position do you want to help people from? And when we were able to kind of tailor down who they wanted to help the most and who they connected with the most, who liked watching their videos and such, the messaging tightened up into that kind of group, like a 20 to 45 year old range, uh, primarily women. When we were able to start tailoring that down for them, it built a much tighter community and now now it's growing and actually their their client base has started becoming some of their best trainers of their material so they they built this community by tailoring down on their messaging and then as that proof and strength was there they were able to start branching that out into the broader market yeah right so it's not like they needed to themselves just grab different demographics it naturally starts to broaden itself out because you've you've taken care of of your core audience mm-hmm. all right so in one of the uh one of your posts recently you talked about um and and it's the picture that i shared in the little skype group that i've got with these guys it was this one that you posted i don't know if so anyway it says you can't communicate your value to your audience they will go elsewhere so Let's look at communicating value through social media now, right? Like what's going on um, with Facebook, with Instagram. Let's kind of hone in on those to begin with. I know you and I were talking a little bit about um, LinkedIn and TikTok. And so we can touch on those. But before we get to those, like if I want to communicate my value that I'm able to deliver to my audience, let's say we've decided on who my demographic is, we've honed in Mm -hmm. and we're going to do this personal brand and we're going to put ourselves out there. So how do we deliver value? in this social media space? The first spot that I want everyone to pay attention to is your headline. If you've had the fortune of someone stumbling across your profile, then they better know very quickly um, 
the kind of the idea of how you could help them. So if we're, this is all platforms, if we're able to take that headline and pull it into 80 characters, we can have that same headline everywhere and avoid any kind of confusion. If someone jumps on Facebook, they should see the same headline of how you can help them as they would see on Instagram or Pinterest or TikTok. Um, but it starts with your headline. Your a lot of people, especially when you're talking headline, we're so yeah, because these guys are able, they've got a banner that they can work with, but not just that, mm -hmm. like your it's kind of your bio who you yes. are is what you're talking about. Yeah. So if we're like on Instagram, then you would have your 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 name and your username, but then underneath that, you got different bio space for slash yeah. headline. Yeah, right. exactly. That is where you really need to first start that effort of communicating your value to them. And a lot of personal brands, the mistake they make is they're worried about sounding really good to themselves. So they put on <laughs> there, I, I'm, a, I'm a, a CEO, I'm a speaker, I've published three books, and that's it. And you're like, well, okay, cool, but how does that help me? There's lots of authors, there's lots of speakers, there's lots of business owners. What what value does that provide me? Right. And that's where a lot of them fail. And so your headline should try and start communicating, hey, if you're coming here, this is what you're going to get. This is who I help. This is how I help. And by doing that and just starting in your headline, you already try and hook them in to why they should be a part of your world. And so that headline really isn't as much like you're saying, it's not for me to say, look how cool I am. It's, I understand your problem. Mm -hmm. And, and I think I might have some help for you. Yep. Okay. So Facebook then, you know, your, what was it like, um, you know, as we kind of talk about branding on online, were you the one that kind of helped started pushing your dad into doing as much as he's doing, or did that come from, you know, he just saw other, entrepreneurs kind of in the space that he was working with how you know are you guiding him behind the scenes like what's that look like yeah he's very good at seeing something coming about and then just diving in and trying it out mm -hmm. so he he dove in and started trying to make content and doing all this stuff uh, where i'm very good is coming in and tailoring and systematizing and making sure that it's uh, repeatable. And so when I came in and looked at his social, it was a matter of, okay, if we take these five minute videos that you're doing and we, we compress the message into 60 seconds, we can put it on all the channels. We can reach more audiences. And um, the, that's, and the hashtags, like there's a lot of different little nuances for the platforms. But what, um, what I was very good at was coming in and just making sure that there was guidance of why we're posting certain bits of content, not just sporadic, but what's the purpose of having an actual purpose in, and kind of guidance behind why you're doing something and what the message should be I'm trying exactly. to stay more true yeah. to it. How do you plan out? Where do you go for ideas on your messages on yeah. content? That was something you kind of talked about in Austin, right? You were talking yeah. about. Um, and, and good job there. I, I think you had said it was one of your first times up on stage. So kudos to you. <laughs> I know yeah. that first time's never easy, especially in a room with everybody that was in there, you know, so well done. So talk, how do you come up with ideas for content then? So with content, you've got, I would say probably three areas. You've got personal inspiration. So what you just know from what people are, uh, dealing with what your, uh, struggles were building up your business and such, um, elaborating on that and content so that if you don't have, my dad actually says, I don't know if he said it on here, but he said, if, if you don't have credibility, then you need to have relatability. So if you don't have immediate results that you can uh, show to people, then you need to at least show them that you completely understand where they're coming from and that you've had a similar experience to them and you've solved the problem. So you know how to take care of it. So creating content that creates this relatability, mm -hmm. uh, that's huge. Also 
creating content that answers people's questions. This okay. is where this is what we were chatting about in Austin. Right. If if you are trying to compete against other people for business, sh- there's a lot of people who think that if you give out info, your clients are going to go and do it themselves and you're actually going to be rejecting business. But that's not true. Most people don't want to do it themselves. Most people want to be able to have it done for them. You're just showing your expertise in the area and also by giving value, answering their questions, you build trust with them. Right. But so where do you find their questions? Because that's yeah. something we talk about, you know, listen to the audience and find out what their problem is and all of that. So where do, like, what do you talk with your clients about when they say, well, all right, well, what questions am I answering? Because what I've found working with, um, you know, people in the space that I do, which is not exactly what you're doing, but kind of helping those people that have something, take it, bring it to the, the masses, right? Is there's a lot of times there's this idea of, well, this is what they need. And then you have the people over here that are saying, no, no, this is what we need. And so how do I bridge that gap from me thinking I know what they need and actually Mm -hmm. understanding what their questions are? Yeah. So two spots, I would say right off the top of my head, is if you're looking for ideas uh, or if you're looking for confirmation as to what people are asking, first place you can look at is in the comment sections of competitors, channels, and platforms and see what they're asking to these already established brands and then answer those questions. But at the same time, once you've defined who your ideal client is, I love using what we use for our clients is a couple tools. One's called Answer the Public. There you go. Answerthepublic.com. That one's... Yep. It's brilliant. There's so much there. Yeah. I think... I think you can get free searches on it. I don't know where it caps it out. Yeah, up to a certain amount. But that's like if you search once and you put in the search the right way, it can give you something like hundreds of topics. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, you know, you get, I think, it, yeah, three per day, Richard Sands, that's more than enough. If you can't find enough topics for a month and three searches, then <laughs> you're just not looking right. Yeah. Okay, so answer the public. Yep. Answer the public. Um, you'll, you'll take like your keywords of what you do, search them in there, and it will give you a, a scrape of the top searches on Google. It'll give you questions searched. It'll give you search queries. Um, so if I put in marketing, it, it would say, um, how can I be better at marketing or what kind of marketing is most effective? It'll start giving you those questions. Um, And you can then take those questions that are relevant to your already drawn out ideal client and create content answering those questions. Right. So answer to public's awesome. Looking in the comments sections of your competitors and also Google trends. This one I love because it is free. That's always nice. And it has it's not only just the highest search volume questions. It's also the most trending and the most trending search queries. So when you go on there, you can compare five of your, of your keywords of what you do, and it will show you the, the trend map of what they've done over time, how the search volume has changed. So you can know what search terms are becoming more popular. Um, And then you can also, when you look through there, see based on zone. So if you're geographical focused, you can see if those questions are more important in California or if they're more searched in Texas. So Google Trends is fantastic because it's free. You can see geographically where these questions are being searched. But you can also see not just what's being searched the most, but what's coming up. And that's a lot of today with social and the internet, things come quick, things go quick. So if you can catch on to that train of something coming up and trending, then you're the relevant source of information. Yeah. So um, 
one quick question CJ's got that you and I can answer together and I'll probably help out because I understand the program a little bit more, but so sure. they've got, we were talking yesterday, um, the basic products that they have are kind of digital products to help businesses generate leads using sh- social media, right? Um, how to turn their social media profile into a, a funnel, how to follow up with their customers. I, I'm sure you've learned working with businesses and I have consulting with people like most people don't have a clue if their website is working, if they get leads from social media, you know, what their call to action is. They don't have a call to action. If they have a regular website, it's like, Hey, call us. And that's about it. You know, so there's very little there. So CJ is saying that he had a, and he has an ad agency that helps people, you know, make additional sales and profits through winning ad strategies. And now we're helping, um, you know, generate other leads through social media. So how to bridge the confusion gap. So, What I would do is, I mean, the only thing I think you'd really have to change, CJ, is that you're still going to help them generate sales and profits through winning strategies instead of just through winning ad strategies. Because now we're showing them more ads and organic. I feel like it kind of holds the same brand. Does all that make sense, Henry? I'm kind of throwing. So he's going from a LinkedIn ads well, on LinkedIn, LinkedIn, on the profile, you had the ad strategies like, hey, we run ads. Okay. And now with this, it's I can help with social media and show you how to generate, essentially generate your own leads. In my mind, it's just I've got multiple strategies to help you generate leads. And yeah. it, it's still the same kind of thing. Yeah. And if you've got if you've already generated results from your LinkedIn strategies or whatever it was you were doing previously, then like we said, you can start broadening out and taking those little elements of what you were already doing and showing why they're applicable to the other areas you're branching out in. So yeah. you're, you're starting to branch out that uh, audience. Um, would there be an, a client avatar be too small or specific? Can you get niched down too far? I would say you could, yeah. but you'd have to work really hard to get too, too small. Yeah. Yeah. It, I think, I think that's probably a problem that most people don't have is niching down yeah. too much because it takes quite a bit of work. Yeah. Um, if you can, I, I, lo- I love it when people give their ideal client a name and I, um, digital marketer is a company that I love and I'm buddies with the guys of it. Is that Ryan Dice or is that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Ryan Dice, um, Richard Lindner, Perry Belcher, Roland Frazier, like all those guys, they're incredible. And uh, they were saying within digital marketer, that they have like a, an actual printout of what their ideal client looks like. And they talk to them with their ideas and their messaging. And they're like, will this resonate with this person? Yeah, most which one of don't these actually define avatars. it that much. Yeah. So they go, well, she is, you know, 44 years old. She's college educated. She holds this kind of degree. She's been doing this. And mm-hmm. then you have the other, you know, John is X, Y, Z. Um, but yeah, Cynthia, I don't think if I remember kind of the, the niche that you were talking about, I, I don't think you're going to. OK, female veteran trying to break into a male dominated industry would targeting women veterans be too small. Women veteran mortgage brokers might be too small. That might be, I mean, at least as far as what we're going for with these products, women veteran mortgage brokers. Now, mortgage brokers that work with veterans, you know, I think is fine. And even even though you're a female veteran, you know, and and it's male dominated, there's more than enough, you know, women in the, the mortgage industry that you'd be fine. But female veteran mortgage brokers, at least as far as this is concerned, I think might be a little bit small. I mean, you could try running an ad, see how many show up. Yeah. I was just going to say that if you don't even, you don't even need to necessarily run the ads to see what kind of audience you have, just start building out the ad and on Facebook, look at what their estimated audience size is. Cause you can definitely get too small. If, if you're, um, if, if you're putting in male guys, 30 years old, who, uh, who love working out, hate cats, 
and and it's within <laughs> a five mile radius, then you're probably going to be limiting your audience pretty pretty big. But um, by going on and creating an ad group in the Facebook ads platform, you can start seeing what their estimation is um, and get an idea of you know uh, job title, mortgage broker, gender, female, and then uh, interests, veteran. And, and that would probably give you a decent uh, estimate as to the size of audience, at least on Facebook. But Facebook is absolutely massive. So that's why yeah, it's, it's, probably it's bigger than you think, guys. Part of it's just kind of playing around and, and learning how to do that inside there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you'd have to look at, I mean, I just pulled it up while Henry was talking. So you have mortgage specialist, mortgage underwriter, mortgage consultant, you know, and, and so you've got some there. Um, Cause again, you're looking for that job title or demographic instead of, you know, and then loan processor, et cetera. So, yeah, I mean, maybe take a look. Um, but Henry, so yesterday you were actually talking about a way that you guys are, are kind of helping push a little bit of engagement with just regular posts and stuff, right? Yeah. So what was that strategy you were talking about? We like, and we were first introduced to it years ago by Dennis Yu. And he's very, very successful um, Facebook ads strategist. And he works with some big people. And he always said about this dollar a day boosting strategy with social media, it's expanding. There's more people on the internet. There's more people creating content. There's more competition with that organic reach is getting so hard, if not already impossible on certain platforms. So what we like to do is we like to put a little bit of money each day behind each posting. And that just helps not only are you, if you put it out organically, you're hoping it right hits the right people. If you put a little bit of money behind it, you have the, when you say a little, how much are you talking about? You're talking about just starting with a dollar. Yeah. Yeah. A dollar a day on each platform will actually get you surprising. You'll, you'll get hundreds more reach Yeah, at least. Absolutely. So, um, you know, we, uh, TikTok, we are huge fans of as well. Organically, you can get incredible reach because they haven't got this kind of algorithmic suppression that some of these other platforms do. They are very happy to throw your content out there and see if it hits. So you have really good chances of hitting people on TikTok. I, I just, I'm imagining the picture you and your dad took the other day in your, in your, racing leathers in and like the two of you doing a TikTok dance together <laughs> and just hoping you find a way to make that happen oh at my some gosh. Point and film that <laughs> so we can I just anyway totally derailed sorry um okay so I love that like the dollar two dollar day getting yourself out there so what do you think for you you know as you kind of go into 2022 do you have any like things you're looking to be able to do with Sims media or, you know, what you think is going to be important for clients to kind of get, you know, to, as they're breaking in, let's look at kind of, you know, strategies that you're wanting to employ right now with people Mm -hmm. going into um, uh, mercy. If you can drop in your comment into the, uh, the chat, that would be great. So let me ask him this question. Then we'll, Madeline, uh, Henry, and I will jump back and forth with the headline on, on wellness. Um, so, <clears throat> but as you move into 2022, is there something that you guys are like, hey, we're going we're gonna to blow this up. We're going to dominate this part of the market. This is something we want to do with our clients. Mm-hmm. Do you have anything like that? It's more a, I, I know that we've got a lot of people in here who are familiar with funnels. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I I want to help kind of, I don't know, get your, your mind connecting in some different ways where I see the mistake of when people look at funnels and they think in terms of funnels, they see it as a single directional thing. And if, if you get people into the top, they will naturally go on through. And with the world right now, targeting is becoming more difficult because Data is being limited and we are having all these privacy issues. 
So what I see is we're trying to create this ecosystem around our funnels, not just, not just talking about a, uh, or trying to push into a funnel immediately. People take time to come around to something and get being, their credit being cards. Being in and creating, a, a, being a part of and creating a community around you and the brand is what you're talking about. Yeah. And you don't want any dependency. So if you're only on, well, actually we've talked about Facebook. Uh, Facebook, it, you hear the horror stories all the time of accounts being banned and locked and gone forever. If you're only on Facebook, then you've got that dependency for it. And that's dangerous for your business. You can definitely play hard on it if it's creating the results right now, but take whatever you're putting on there and also put it on your other platforms and start. Yeah, you can use the exact same content. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of these guys are doing more organic and so they're not running ads and, and, mm -hmm. you know, not going super aggressive. So you don't have as many problems with getting things shut down, cool. but um, you know, that's kind of, that's where I would begin. And then, yeah, you, you can take the same stuff and use it on, on all of these other platforms. Right. Yeah. So, but you're talking about building out, you know, building a brand in a broader way, using the same content. So we're not doing extra work, mm -hmm. right? Because a lot of people kind of get scared by that. You go, oh, you know, you can use it on Facebook. Make sure you have other accounts. Oh my God, it's so much more work. No, no, it's copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste, done, <laughs> right? Essentially, um, you know, and then, but building the community out in a number of different areas is what you're talking mm -hmm. about there, right? And yeah. then you bring them to the funnel. But what you're saying is like, Funnels can be effective, but if you build them up around here before trying to shove them, shove the funnel down their throat is what you're saying. Yeah. What you want a fallback. If you manage to get someone to the funnel and for some reason they leave and don't want to buy, you want to keep them in your world still yeah. so that you have the time to nurture them back into it. So if you've got right. social media, a website, podcasts, a YouTube channel, making all of these assets work together making sure they know they can find these other areas to consume content from you. Right. If they fall out of your funnel, they can still continue to consume your podcast in the car on the way to work or watch your YouTube videos and build more and more trust with you until the time is right. And the trust is there that they jump back in and yeah. complete the funnel. So it's having that full ecosystem for being able to uh, build the connection with your audience, like gain their eyeballs, but then also continue to nurture it and give them this full content bank that they can that's, binge on. That says so much for the organic side. You know, we talk a lot about on here, guys, is, you know, put out the organic work. And, and we had, you know, sometimes people say, well, I ran this ad and it didn't work. Well, if you do it the right way and, the, and there's content on your page and you're, they can find you in other places, now I've got a chance to either organically retarget or go after them in other ways because I'm constantly putting out valuable content that they will engage in, right? If all I do is I run ads and there's nothing on my page, then yeah, it's a one shot, one pitch, swing and a miss, and then you're done. Whereas if I'm running, like Michelle, what he's talking about is just a dollar a day. Yeah, run from your business page. Instagram, you can run it on every single post. You can't run an ad from your, your personal, but he's just talking about you, you put up a relevant post. It's got some good content. You spend a dollar or two a day to put it in front of the audience you want to put it in front of. And that's it. And it just raises engagement. And so you maybe get some extra likes or comments. You get extra people looking at your page. You start to get people used to seeing you when it's the same audience each time, as opposed to changing my audience every single time and hopefully getting them to come in to this world that you're starting to nurture. I think that's kind of what you were talking about. Yeah. Um, let's see. There are a lot of people on Facebook. There's Madeline, there's just under two point, there's 2.7 or 2.8 billion people on Facebook at this point. So yeah, there's plenty there. There's plenty to go around. <laughs> um, so I, I appreciate you coming on. Um, Absolutely. Where do you see, yourself and and sims oh that was the that was the question that got asked earlier so um talking about a, a headline so she's in wellness 
and helping people as kind of a health coach. Um, I mean, I got a couple of ideas, but what's something you might put in a headline there that would be speaking to the audience as opposed to look at how cool I am. Okay. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. So, so let's say a wellness there, coach. Is there any further detail as to what they do? I'm trying to look through the chat. Um, no, right there is just kind of um, a wellness coach. I'm in wellness, so I can say live happy with wellness maintenance. So I would just, I would, the first thing you need to do, I think, is do what you were talking about, Henry, is go to create a better demographic of who you want to help. Because even though everybody could benefit from being healthier and having wellness, it's just, it's, it's too broad, right? And so you yeah. want to focus in on who the audience is. Yeah, because um, if you're able to call that out, who, and, and your headlines can change. As you build your client bank, as you build proof of your business and you want to expand your audience, you can change your headline. It's not set in stone. Right. But um, change it yeah, I would, I would say if you've got, if you know the exact kind of demographic you want to work with, it kind of call them out in that headline because you see a lot of time when you've got online courses, if I'm a marketer or um, let's see, if I am, if I'm a dad and I want to lose weight, if I see a course on how to lose weight, or I see a course on how to lose weight as a dad with very little time, I'm going to that jump one. on the one. Yeah. Yeah. Because it calls me out. So right. you, being able to just call someone out and know that they're, that you are talking to them is going to help uh, already become a much more effective connection on your headline. Yeah. I help. Um, yeah. I mean, that's, that's a great point. You know, I help busy moms um, with, with little time to take care of themselves, find the moments they need for better health. I mean, something along those lines, right? Like you, you find who your audience is guys. And so that's why over and over and over, when we talk about your niche and we talk about your demographic, understanding them, and this goes to what you were talking about earlier about the credibility and relatability, what your dad was saying, like, if I don't know everything about everything, well, then I can be relatable to you and tell you, you know, if I understand fully your problem, then I can make that work. Um, if you can add a justifiable proven metric to it, that helps a lot. Yeah, if you can at the beginning, but if you don't have one at the beginning yet, Richard, like, oh, I've helped you know, X amount, like one of the things that I, I do with consulting is, you know, with the standard business, I can help a regular business find anywhere between, you know, an additional 20 to a hundred thousand dollars in under 45 minutes without spending extra money on ads, because I just go through with them. You find out where they're wasting money. You figure out what their call to action should be. You work on, you know, some joint ventures that they're not taking advantage of. And the fact that they're probably not servicing the clients that they have the right way, and it's easy to find some money, right? So yeah, if you've got a metric, sure. But if you understand who your audience is, that would be the the way to go after it. So, all right. Yeah. Um, and even, and the metrics are, are nice for um, result, but it's also nice because it's just the use of numbers and people do like numbers. So even if, uh, if you've got a wellness system that falls into five steps or three steps, being able to say, I help dads lose weight in a three-step process or in three you know, easy like, steps. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. People love or that 60 days, you know, mm. like that kind of stuff really resonates with people. Did, um, I just went down to my mailbox yesterday and I got this Sims speakeasy letter <laughs> yesterday. Um, so one of the cool things at the end of Austin guys is he had, uh, Steve had us write down things that we were going to do, what we took out of it, and then what we were going to, um, do for ourselves. Right. Did you write one of these when you were out there? Did you fill one out? Me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or have you done it so many times that you're like, okay, dad, I get it. Oh yeah. I, I did. Well, I, I did it the <clears throat> week before speakeasy. Oh, okay. So <laughs> Would you share um, like one thing that like you're going after 
that <clears throat> like a goal that you've got that you're pushing towards? Do you be willing to share something like that? Yeah. It's building out our team. That That is my number one goal right now. We've got awesome uh, services and we're getting a lot of client interest. And so now um, the, the rate of growth, I'm like, we got to build out our teams even further. So I'm trying to build a more um, build an, a more improved system for finding and hiring awesome people to be a part of what we're doing. And I've got two interviews coming up uh, in a couple of days with some more people. So it's, that's, that's the biggest goal. That's where I see our biggest bottleneck is we've got awesome stuff. We've got awesome interest. So you gotta deliver. I just, exactly. Yeah. We just need to well, make sure we can continue to do that. Cause you're looking for talent at a level that, um, you know, you're not looking for entry level people that are just getting started. You know, you need someone that can deliver at a real high level for some movers and shakers that are out there. That yeah. just haven't done it yet. <laughs> I think there's a lot of, um, that that's one of the interesting things that we're working on is it's like, do you really need a resume saying that you've done exactly what we're looking for, for a long time? Right. Or do you need the mindset and the, the work ethic and the passion and interest for the specific things that we need done? Because I like to, I want everything we do to be repeatable. Right. And if, if I can't, if I fail to draw out systems and procedures that other people can't look at and. Yeah. If they can't on, replicate it. There's something to yeah. be said for talent, but if you can't, if something happens to that talent and now you can't replace it and everything falls apart behind yeah. it. Yeah. It becomes rough. I, I get that. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, what, I do. I appreciate you being on. We've gone over what I, I think I told you. So a couple of quick fire <laughs> questions, um, kind of last minute. Do you have a, a favorite book, maybe something that you gift on an, uh, a frequent basis or, you know, something that's kind of changed your life besides, you know, blue fishing. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. I've got my little, one of some of my favorite books. I think the, I think the one book that really, and that's funny that I even use that vocab word, the book that really started to alter the way I work is called The One Thing. And it just talks about prior, prioritizing your to-do lists. And every single day, what's the one thing that if you could only do that one thing would make the most impact in whatever it is you're trying to achieve. And so when, uh, when I read that book, I think as entrepreneurs, business owners, we all need to understand that train of thought and how to prioritize the immense amount of things that we have to do every single day into the most impactful ones. Right on. So that's Gary Keller, right? The one yeah. thing. Yep. Um, awesome. So next question that I saw, and this, I think this is like a Tim Ferriss. So um, end of the year now, best buy that you've had under a hundred dollars this year, like something that you've bought. That's just like, Hey, this was really cool. <laughs> And this doesn't relate to business, just like anything, anything. anything. Ooh, under a hundred dollars. Hmm. I'm going to say I, I bought um, a little camping stove, got a little Coleman camping stove and I've just been obsessed with it because uh, no more crappy little takeaway meals. Uh, when I go camping, I actually get to go and cook up and, uh, uh, have fresh food when I go camping. That's been one of my favorite little purchases under a hundred bucks. That's great, man. <laughs> um, I, and I could keep throwing these at you all day, but I appreciate you coming on guys. I'm going to let, we're going to wrap up. Um, Henry, dude, the, the, the nuggets, the wisdom, all of it. Um, you know, you're, you were wise beyond your years, my good man. <laughs> um, keep pushing yourself forward and, and, you know, maybe one of these days I can, I can get you back. I'll make sure that, uh, you know, like I told you yesterday, I may not be able to get to Brooklyn, but I'll be able to, you know, we'll, you'll see me regularly at the speakeasies, but everybody kind of hop on say, thank you. 
Um, drop into the chat, say hello. Appreciate you coming on, dude. As always, it's, um, it's good thanks, talking Henry. to you. Yeah, so, thanks, Henry. Appreciate it. Thank you uh, so Henry. much. This has been so informative. And then, um, guys, we'll get to other yeah. questions here coming up. We've got a guest coming tomorrow, uh, Tara Atkinson, that does copy and stuff. Um, but again, dude, you're a rock star. Thank you very much. I appreciate you coming on. I'll get you a little clip that you guys, you can throw up on Facebook. I'll have my guy edit something for you. So Sounds good. Thank you, man. Everybody have an awesome day. We'll talk to Sometimes you people have yeah, what it takes, but they haven't recognized it yet. Just go forward. So what do you need to do? How do you stand out? So what you need to do is be that person that's different and is bigger than you think. Rise from the ashes and fly like the phoenixes that you are.